In an isolated system, momentum is conserved, which we mean you can transfer it from one item in the system to another item in the system, but the total amount won't change. Now, it has to be an isolated system. So here's a few example problems dealing with this. First, two identical cars collide in a head-on collision. So what we've got is car one going that way, and car two. Now watch this, you're going to complain that I didn't draw it identically, but what I really mean that they're identical, well, my black pen's not working as well as I would like, that they're identical is that they have the same mass is really what matters here. Both are initially moving with the speed V equals 20 meters per second. Which for, uh, I've also given to you that it's 45 miles per hour if you do the conversion. So 45 miles per hour, this is sort of like a not pure residential road, but not freeway, sort of intermediate kind of road speed. You drive at this speed all the time, probably. Okay, and so... Assuming the cars become entangled and move together after the collision, what is the final speed of each car? And so the idea is that this is the before the collision. They're moving at this. And then after the collision, we have the two cars together in a single wreck, moving with some capital V, we'll call it afterwards, that way. And let's define our axes, x that way, y that way, z out of the board, only x matters. So we can use the conservation of momentum for this. Well, first we ought to think about isolation. This system is not isolated in the y direction because these cars have the normal force of the ground pushing up on them and gravity pushing down, or they exactly cancel out. But also they're not moving in the y direction. So, okay, momentum is not conserved in the y direction because there are external forces, but we don't care. In the x direction, do we have isolation? Well, that's a little harder, because there, there probably is, at this speed, there is some air resistance, and there is maybe some friction as a result of uh, the tires. You know, tires, if they're a perfect hard round wheel, there would be no frictional losses, just the static friction, but they do compress a little bit, and as a result, you get a little bit of friction on the ground. So there's probably some friction with the ground. Those would be external forces in the x direction, which would break conservation of momentum, but what we do have is momentary isolation. So just the instant before the two cars touch to the instant after they're done colliding, that's going to be a short period of time. And we'll actually calculate the amount of time in a little bit here. That's going to be a short period of time. And over that amount of time, air resistance, so an air resistance does not go up as the collision speed goes down. It just is what it is. Um, I mean, in fact, as, well, air resistance is the strongest it'll be is when at the start when the cars are moving the fastest. So um, that's not a force like uh, nailing the hockey puck into the ice where the faster the collision, the more the hockey puck's nail resists. So, so that's fine. So air resistance is the sort of thing that if your collision is fast enough, you could ignore for momentary isolation, likewise for friction. So we do have momentary isolation in the x direction, so momentum will be conserved in the x direction. So the initial momentum in the x direction, let's call m the mass of the car. So from this one, well here, I'll, I'll write it all the way out. So the initial x is m1 v1 x plus m2 v2 x. But we know that m1 is just m the mass of the car. v1 x is v, because it's going in the plus x direction. m2 is m, and v2 x is minus v, because it's got speed v in the negative direction. So the initial momentum is zero, in the x direction, which means, oh, PFx is the mass of the wreck, which is 2m, because there's two cars together, times capital V, also has to equal zero, so the answer is V equals zero. These two cars, and maybe this is obvious, maybe not, I don't know, but these two cars coming at the same speed together, they crash, and they just stop right in the middle like that. So that's the first problem, that's the, uh, that's the, the main momentum problem. So now that's part A. Now B, if each car has a mass of 1,500 kilograms, what is the impulse each car experiences? So remember, impulse is just delta P. And what I'm going to do is what's the magnitude of the impulse each car experiences? Well, that's just going to be the magnitude of PF minus PI, which in this case is 
PFX minus PIX, because notice nothing's moving in the Y or Z directions. Well, and that's not too hard because it is zero is the final momentum of each car. The initial momentum of each car is MV, either minus or plus, depending on which car we're talking about, but we're talking absolute values here, so it's the same. So the magnitude of the impulse is just MV, so we can calculate that. That's 1,500 kilograms times 20 meters per second. That's equal to 30,000 kilogram meters per second. And that's the impulse that each car experiences. Okay, part C. Cars have crumple zones on their front, which are designed to compress and deform in order to increase the collision time. And we will talk in a moment about why you would want to increase the collision time. It does mean that um, the fact that cars are actually designed to crumple when they get into an accident means that cars wrecks look worse than they would if you designed the car very, car very rigidly, but there's good reasons to do this. So, um, assuming that each car has a crumple zone on the front that is one meter wide and that will compress to half its original size during the collision, how long does the collision take? So the basic idea is, as the collision starts, you have the two cars, my drawing's getting worse as time goes by, you have the two cars like this, and then there's a crumple zone here, which I'm going to draw as the whole hood that is one meter, and then when the thing is done, It looks like this, which actually I already have it drawn, but here I am drawing it again for deep epistemological reasons. Um, this is now only 0.5 meters. The other thing is, when the collision starts, the instant before the two run into each other, this car, we'll just look at the car on the left here, is still moving with speed V, and here this car has speed V equals zero. How long does the collision take? Well, so what we know, I'm also going to, what we know is that um, x minus x0, the position of the car, is equal to 0.5 meters, right, because it's half of the crumple zone. That's also going to equal v0xt plus 1 half axt squared. So I could use this with a quadratic formula to figure out what t is, but I don't know ax. So let's think about ax. We know that also that vf minus vi is equal to ax, let's say vfx minus vix is equal to ax times t. vfx is zero, vix is just v, is going to equal ax times t. So t, sorry, ax is what I'm after, is just equal to minus v over t. This is just the delta v over delta t equals a equation is really what that is. So ax is minus v over t, so what I can do is put this in here to x minus x zero is equal to v so V0x is just V times T minus one half times V over T times T squared. And hey, look, it simplified itself because I have this T cancels the T squared and it becomes just V T over two subtracted from VT. So that's just VT over two. Or T is equal to two times X minus X naught over V. So that tells us how long the collision is going to take. And so now I can plug that in. X minus X naught is 0.5 meters. The initial speed is 20 meters per second. So let's see. So we have 2 divided by 20. That's going to be 10 on the bottom. 0.5 meters divided by 10 meters per second is 0.05 seconds. That's fast. Okay. That's what I'm going to actually call it. I should have called it delta T. But I'm going to call it delta T. This is assuming this was t equals zero and this is t final, so delta t is the time between them. So 0 0.05 seconds is delta t. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of scary fast, but that says that it comes in and 20th of a second later the collision is done. Um, but it would be worse if it was even faster. So good, okay, given that, what is the average force on each car in both newtons and pounds during the collision? I'm going to erase, no, I can do it all over here. <clears throat> well, remember, magnitude of force is just delta P over delta T. That's uh, how you relate change in impulse, or impulses, change in momentum, change in momentum to force. And we actually have these numbers in this case. 
So the average force is going to be 30,000 kilogram meters per second divided by 5 times 10 to the, I'm going to write this instead of 30,000, write it as 3 times 10 to the 4 divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds, right, two decimal places over. One, two, three, four zeros, yes. And that's because I know that three six, three, three, <clears throat> talking is so hard. Three fifths is 0.6 times four divided by negative two. Well, that's four minus negative two, rather. is 0.6 times 10 to the six, and kilogram times meters divided by seconds divided by seconds. So that's kilogram meters per second squared. So that's six times 10 to the fifth newtons, which is 600,000 newtons. How many pounds is that? Well, we have to look up the conversion between newtons and pounds. All right, so to convert to pounds, if 0.2248 pounds per newton, so if we do that product, we get 135,000 pounds. That is a lot of force. Now, of course, this is on the whole car, so it's not like you set down a 135,000 pound thing right on the hood, but 135,000 pounds of force on the whole front of your car, and it's no wonder that the whole thing crumples up when you get into a collision like this. So 0.05 seconds, scary fast, but here's the thing. Notice that this F is delta P over delta T, and we were talking about how that's a lot of force. The smaller delta T gets, the bigger F gets for a given delta P, right? So if, if the numerator is fixed, if I divide by a littler number, I get a bigger number on the left side here. So that's why you want to make delta T as big as possible, because that means that the force you need in order to, to do the stop is less. It's the same reason why if you jump onto the ground and you hit sort of soft padding, it's not nearly as bad as hitting concrete. Why? Because the total force that you need is less because the soft padding has some time to compress, whereas the concrete, the collision is really fast. On the atomic level, it will still compress a little bit. But um, if this delta T is bigger with this compression or with the crumple zone, then the force doesn't have to be as high. It's still pretty scary. If you get into a collision like this, you're probably sad. You really hope you have an airbag in your car so that your head going forward has even more time to slow down as a result of the airbag, in addition to the crumple zone working together. Um, but really the best thing is sort of not to get into an accident like this. That's kind of what I recommend. That's problem one. In the second problem, we have a bowling ball of mass capital M precariously balanced on the top of a narrow rod of height H. So here's our ground. We have a narrow rod and a bowling ball. Right? That seems kind of perverse. That's height H. The bowling ball has mass capital M. Why do you do this? I don't know. You have your own reasons, all right? I, I'm not going to question it. Whatever. So you've balanced this bowling ball. You throw a tennis ball at it, aim so that the tennis ball of mass little m is at the apex of its arc when it bounces off of the bowling ball. So the idea is, is you've thrown a tennis ball and it's right at the apex of its arc, moving with some speed, let me guess, it's v. Oh yes, how did I know? Moving with speed v and it's going to bounce off of the bowling ball. And it's going to bounce directly back with the same speed. You may assume there's no friction between the bowling ball and the narrow rod. The balance is really precarious. Where does the bowling ball hit the ground? So let's think about, I mean, obviously what's going to happen is the tennis ball, the bowling ball is very precarious. The tennis ball hits it, it's going to knock it off, and the bowling ball is going to boom, fall. And the question is, how fast does the bowling ball come off so that how far over does it hit? Okay, so let's think about this. Well, the first thing we need to think about is just the collision itself. So we have a before, which is big M with little m going this way, and then we have an after, so that we know that's speed v. We have, and I'm going to call this v0 for reasons that will become clear much later, we have that guy of little m going back at speed v that way. So that's the before and after, and what we want to do, it'll turn out in, when we get into energy conservation that there must have been a little tiny explosive charge on this tennis ball for this to work, huh. but okay, let's not worry about that. 
Um, or we'll talk about it kind of in the next problem. And we're not doing energy conservation yet, just momentum. So let's think about momentum conservation here. Um, I want to define x that way and y that way. So in this case, the initial momentum in the x direction is just minus mv, right? Because we have v in the negative x direction. And the final is minus capital MV0 plus little mv. Now let's think about isolation. We are certainly not isolated in the vertical direction because there's a normal force of this rod and gravity. Now gravity is always the force that it is. So if you make delta t small enough, the impulse of gravity, mg delta t, can be neglected in the collision. But that won't be true for this normal force. So we certainly do not have isolation in the y direction. But notice we're just working in the x direction here. Do we have isolation in the x direction? Uh, yes, actually we do, because I told you there's no friction on this rod. So that means this bowling ball can freely, it's really precariously balanced, it can freely slide off of the rod. So we do have isolation in the x direction for this collision. So let's go ahead and work out, um, this was PFX, momentum conservation. Initial is equal to final because we have isolation. So minus MV has to equal minus capital MV0 plus MV. Uh, move this there and this there. I will go capital MV0 is equal to 2 little MV or V0 is equal to 2 times little m over big, big m times v. And so now I know the speed that the bowling ball bounces off. That wasn't the question though. The question is, where does the bowling ball hit the ground? So this now becomes a ballistics problem. So what we need to do to figure out where the bowling ball hits the ground is let's do another problem. So the bowling ball is going to start at y naught equals h, and let's say x naught equals 0, with v naught vector is equal to minus 2m over big M v in the x hat direction. Why minus when it wasn't minus here? Well, notice it's just going to the left here, and that's the magnitude. And so the x component is minus v naught, and I put that in here by doing this. So yes, the x component is that. So that's actually the full-on vector, and the acceleration we know is just minus g in the y hat direction. So knowing all of that, what we can do is we can write down that for the bowling ball, x is equal to x0 plus v0xt, and x0 is of course 0, and y is equal to y0 plus v0yt, and v0y is 0, plus 1 half ayt squared, I should have had a one-half ax t squared here, but I know that this shouldn't have been ax. That's just a. I know that ax is zero. Okay, good. So um, we know what's going to happen is the bowling ball is going to come down here, and it's going to hit the ground, something like that. And what we're really interested in is this distance. So what we're after is x. We know vox, but we don't know t. So we can figure out t because when it hits the ground, y is zero. And notice it really is h is the height of the rod, and it's the bottom of the ball that's going to hit the ground, so we don't have to worry about that, is equal to y0 h, no v0 y, plus 1 half, I'm going to write it one, minus 1 half g t squared, because a y is minus g. So that gives us h is equal to 1 half g t squared, or 2 h over g is equal to t squared, or t is equal to the square root of 2h over g. All right, and so now knowing that t is equal to the square root of 2h over g, I can figure out what x is. So x now is, holding pens is hard. Everything is hard, it's all hard. x is equal to v0x, which is um, minus two little m over big M times v times t, which is the square root of 2h over g. And here's your answer. I might simplify it a little bit into, um, how would I simplify this? I don't know if I would simplify it. I think I'll just leave it like that. So what this says is that this distance is 2 little m over big M v root 2h over g, or x means, this negative just means it's to the left here. So that's very good. And then in part B, I just say, oh, evaluate this numerically. Now here's the reason I did this. 
I could have just said at the very beginning, capital N is six kilograms and little n is 58 grams and all of that. I could have just given you the numbers at the beginning in hopes that you would have done it exactly the same way, that you would work all the way to this x without ever plugging a number in. Now it's okay if you got to this and you plug the number in, you had the v0, and then you use that v0 here, and you know, that would have been an okay way to do it. But I do want you to practice doing it the whole way through symbolically, and that's why I, I phrased this question in such a way that you have to do the whole thing symbolically. You don't even have numbers till part b. But now we have numbers in part b, and what we have is capital M is equal to 6.0 kilograms, lowercase m is equal to 58 grams, so that's 0 0.058 kilograms. Um, H is 3 meters, so that's a pretty tall rod. It's implausible that you'd actually balance the bowling ball, but let's not worry about it. And V is 15 meters per second. I think it's, you can get a tennis ball going that fast. I don't know, throwing it that fast might be kind of hard. That's going to be a little over 30 miles per hour. You could certainly do that with a baseball. Tennis ball? Probably. I don't know. Somebody get a, get a radar gun and work on it. So let's just put the numbers in. So this tells me that the distance to the left is going to equal minus 2 times 0 0.058 kilograms. I can tell already I'm going to run out of space. Divided by 6.0 kilograms times V, 15 meters per second, times the square root of 2 times 3 meters divided by g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. g is not negative, remember that. All right, put all of these numbers into your calculator. And when all is said and done, you get 0. Point, sorry, there's that negative, so uh, 2, 3 meters. So that says this bowling ball, or this tennis ball, comes in at 30 miles an hour, and it knocks this much heavier bowling ball, and it goes and only drops about, landing on the ground only about 20 centimeters over from where it started, which now you should be worried about the facts like, wait a minute, if the bowling ball falls like that on its way down, won't the rod get in the way? Yeah, probably. Let's just, let's just not ask that question. But yeah, in reality, you probably actually have to think about that now. But the whole point of this problem was to think about the momentum. Here's an example of a momentum conservation problem. Um, and then also realizing that sometimes you're going to mix different things we've learned in the class together. Momentum conservation handles just the collision itself. But when you want to think about the bowling ball flying through the air, you go back to ballistics because that's really what's going on there. You just use the kinematic equations. Um, if you wanted, it probably would not have been a bad idea to draw a free body diagram for the bowling ball. Except that's capital N. There, done. That was the free body diagram for the bowling ball. I could have done that. Good. All right. That is the second problem. Third problem. A ball bounces off a much more massive object. Say a wall, but a wall floating freely in space. Or say a bowling ball. Yeah, we've kind of already done this, but here we'll do it again. So a ball, we have a much more massive object. I'll we'll start like this. Um, the ball's mass is M and the wall's mass is capital M. So the ball comes in at speed, suppose the ball hits the wall perpendicular to the plane of the wall and bounces off at the same speed it came in. So it comes in at speed V. This wall is huge, is mass capital M, and the idea is that capital M is a lot bigger than little m. That's what that means. Okay, what is the recoil speed of the wall? So we've got this, and after the ball, the ball's gonna bounce off at the same speed and then I'm going to use capital V here for the recoil speed of the wall. So that's before and that's after. This is basically identical to the bowling ball collision we just did. So I will do it again. X is that way, so in this case PI is equal to MV, and PF is equal to capital M, capital V, which is in the plus X direction and in the minus X direction, we have minus MV. And this was PIX and PFX. We should talk about isolation. The ball and the wall are the only things in the entire universe, therefore it's isolated. Good. We have isolation in all directions. Only things are moving in X, so PFY and PFZ, they're all zero. PIY, PIZ, they're all zero. They're not interesting, so we'll just stick with that. So what is the recoil speed of the wall? Well, you know where this is going to go because we've done it before. So MV is equal to capital M, capital V, minus MV, or capital V is equal to 2 mv 
over capital M. So what I did is I added this MV over here, that became 2MV, divided both sides by capital M, I get that. Although the way I really prefer to write it, I'm gonna write it up here, is um, two times M over M times V. All right, so that's the recoil speed of the wall. Show that in the wall's initial frame of reference, its recoil speed is very small. Now I use that scary word in frame of reference. Well, it turns out this is the wall's initial frame of reference. Because the wall is at rest in that frame. And so its frame of reference is the frame of reference in which it's at rest. So this is the speed and the initial frame of reference. How do I show that this is small? And small with respect to what? What is small? Right? Is, is an inch small? If you're a building, yes. If you're an ant, no. So what is small? So you have to know what we're comparing it to. Well, if we're talking speeds, the only other speed in the problem we have is V. So what we're really after is V a whole lot less than little v. Well, let's start with this. If I divide both sides by capital M, I have that one is a lot greater than little m over capital M, which is the same if I turn this whole thing around as saying that little m over capital M is a lot less than one. So if I look at this, this tells me that two times something a lot less than one is still a whole lot less than one, right? If it's 0.01, now it's 0.02, both of those are very small. That therefore, little v, whatever it is, capital V is something a lot less than one times little v. That tells me that capital V has to be a lot less than little v, because it's a small number times little v, right? This is what we really mean when we say capital V is small. Capital V is a whole lot less than little v, given this difference in masses and given the speed we worked out, okay? So that's that. And then finally, in the frame of reference where the ball starts at rest, what is the initial and final speed of the ball? Well, okay. So what we're gonna do now is do a frame transformation into another frame, the primed frame, which I will draw in red here. The primed frame, x prime, y prime, is moving with speed v, little v, I know I used capital V in the past for this, but it's little v is this, the velocity, well, little v in the x direction, is the velocity of the prime frame relative to the unprimed frame because that is the frame in which this guy is at rest. So we can do the frame transformation. So capital V x prime is going to equal capital V, um, V i x, which is zero, right? So this is the initial x velocity of the wall in the unprimed frame. This is capital V i x prime, right? Minus the velocity of the frame relative to the other frame. So V i x prime is just equal to minus V. And likewise, little v i x prime is equal to little v i x minus v, and little v i x is of course v minus v is zero. That's no surprise because we chose this frame to be the one where v i x prime is zero, where the ball is at rest. And let's think about the final speeds. v f x prime is equal to v f x minus v is minus v minus v is zero. Right, Vfx is this. Well, it's minus V because it's V in the minus X direction. And that, I lied to here, that's not equal to zero. That's equal to minus two V. And then finally, capital V F X prime is equal to capital V F X minus the velocity, the X component of the velocity of the prime frame relative to the unprime frame, which is V. And capital VFX, that's what this is, right? Here's the final in the unprime frame, so that's two times little m over big M times V minus V, which is equal to little v times, um, let me write it like this, I wanna factor out a negative sign for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. One minus two little m over big M. Okay. So that's what all of these velocities look like in the frame of reference where the little ball is initially at rest. Now that we know this, 
I'm going to draw this. So in this primed frame, this guy starts at rest. This guy comes in at speed, and notice V, I, X, prime, V. So this is before, and then after, this guy is moving at a speed we'll talk about in a moment. This guy is going off at speed 2V. All right, so this guy is coming in, and then what is this? Well, I want to look at this VFX prime here. It's equal to minus V times 1 minus 2M over M. This is 1 minus something that is a whole lot less than 1, right? Again, remember that this says that little m over big M is a whole lot less than 1. So say it's like 0.02. What's 1 minus 0.02? That's 0.98. It's something very close to 1. So this is very close, depending on how these masses compare, very close to minus V. So this, its speed almost doesn't change. And, and that kind of matches what you think. It's a big old wall coming along and something bounces off. Its speed hardly changes. It does change because of conservation of momentum, but not by much. And so this is very close to V. It's not exactly V. It's a little bit less, but it's very close to V. So this is relevant to things like tennis rackets hitting balls. If you have a ball that's just, just at rest, which I know they're not really, um, but suppose you're like using a, a bat and hitting it off a tee or something like that. If you have a ball that's at rest and something really big, and a tennis racket counts as really big because you're holding on to it, so in a sense, all of your mass is there, not really, but you've got a force that's going to keep it moving at a constant speed. So if it keeps moving at a constant speed, well, that's what you would get if it were a really massive thing and hit it freely, so this would apply. The ball will go off at twice the speed, assuming that this bounce works, and we get to conservation of energy, we'll see what motivated that. It'll go off at twice the speed that the tennis racket came in, so boom! That's why tennis rackets actually can hit things and not keep up with the ball after it, they hit it. So that's how this thing works out. So this was just the same momentum conservation thing we did in the last problem, but here's an example of converting from one frame of reference, which was the frame of reference where the wall starts at rest, to another the frame of reference where the ball starts at rest. And this is what it looks like there. That's how I did that conversion. So that is the third problem. But Dr. Knopp, I hear you crying, existential angst in your voice. Up to now, all the problems, all the examples you've done have been one-dimensional collisions. What about collisions in two dimensions, or even three? Well, okay, three is so hard to draw. Let's do two dimensions. So here's the problem, a cue ball is coming in, moving at 2.5 meters per second. So here's the cue ball. And I will call V0. V0 is the initial speed of the cue ball. Let's see if I can give it a little 3D shading. It's coming in, moving at 3.5, or sorry, 2.5 meters per second. In the plus x direction, I'm going to define x and y this way. And in this case, we are looking down on the pool table. So z is up. So this is the surface of the pool table here. All right, it hits the eight ball, which is at rest. After the collision, the eight ball is moving at a speed of two meters per second. That's wrong. Let me fix that. All right, after the collision, the eight ball is moving at a speed of 2.27 meters per second. Okay, at an angle of 25 degrees with respect to the horizontal, and, or with respect to the x-axis in the plus y direction. So initially, here's the eight ball, and it's initially at rest. And then afterwards, the eight ball is moving there. I will call this V8 for the speed of the eight ball. I will call this theta, because when you only have one angle, you always seem to call it theta. Theta is equal to 25 degrees, and V8 is equal to 2.27 meters per second. Really, we have three sig figs on this one, too. I'll draw that zero in. And the question is, what is the velocity of the cue ball? So what we want to find is this arrow. So what I'm going to do is divide this into VFX and VFY. So VF, V0 is the initial speed of the cue ball, VF is the final speed of the cue ball of the VFX, and I did them backwards. Here's VFX and VFY. We want to find that. Okay, what do we have to work with? Well, all we have to work with is the conservation of momentum. So let's think about isolation. 
clearly not isolated in the z direction because there's gravity down and there is the normal force of the pool table pushing back up. But in the x and y directions, well, okay. If you've ever actually played pool, you know these balls don't roll forever. They eventually slow down because of friction with the fuzzy little table there. But, again, that's going to be friction, and it's going to have a constant magnitude, depending just on the normal force and the coefficient of friction. It's not going to go up with sh if, if collision times go down or anything like that. So we do have momentary isolation, so it's reasonable to say we've got isolation in the x and y directions as long as we look just before and just after the collision, which is what we're doing. So we can conserve momentum in both the x and the y directions. So we have pix is equal to mv0. I should also say that these two balls are assumed to have the same mass. I didn't tell you what it is, which means it had better divide out. Um, so pix is mi0 and piy is 0. Okay, that's not so bad. This one, harder. Pfx. In the x direction we have, well, we have the x component of v8. So notice this is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's going to be mv8 cosine theta plus mvfx, the x component of the cue ball's final velocity. And then pfy is equal to m v8 sine theta plus m v f y, the y component of the cue ball's final speed. Well, okay, so now what we can do is we can set pi is equal to pf as a vector, and the z components are uninteresting because nothing's moving in z. I'm going to do the y component first because that one's easier because the initial is zero. So what I can say is from this, I know that zero PFY has to equal PIY, so 0 has to equal MV8 sine theta plus MVFY. I can divide both sides by N. Hey, look, that's good. That went away. So VFY is equal to minus V8 sine theta. So I'm already half done because I have the Y component of the velocity. And I know this number, and I know that number. I can plug them in. I'll do that a little later. So now let's talk about X. With x over here, we have the initial x momentum is mv0, and the final is equal to mv8 cosine theta plus mvfy. And look, again, I can divide both sides by m, because there's an m on both terms here, and that goes away. I want to get vfy by itself, so this should have been vfx, right, because it was vfx here. I want to get vfx by itself, so I subtract v0 minus v8 cosine theta is equal to vfx, right, and now I'm done. So now I can put in numbers for both. So v0 is 2.50 meters per second minus 2.27 meters per second times cosine 25 degrees. That's what vfx is going to be. And then VFY, this is going to be minus 2.27 meters per second times sine of 25 degrees. So I put both of those in my calculator. And I get minus 0.44 meters per second for VFY. And for VFX, I get 0.96 meters per second, and I'm done. I'm just going to write it as one final thing. I know that the final velocity of the cue ball in x is 0.96 meters per second, and y is minus 0.44 meters per second, comma zero. So you see the cue ball is going quite a bit slower. We could work out this speed, and it would be just a little bit over one meter per second. So the cue ball is moving quite a bit slower than the eight ball afterwards, which is probably what you wanted. And it does go off at an angle, something like this. So there you go. That's a two-dimensional collision just considering conservation of momentum. And that is the end of the problems for this week.